All right, everyone. Good afternoon. On behalf of Columbia University, the School of Professional Studies, and our master's program in wealth management, it is an honor to welcome you all to this, our ninth speaker series event, where from time to time, we invite industry practitioners and thought leaders to come and share with us their thoughts and perspectives on our fast evolving wealth management industry. My name is Philip Hecker. I am a member of the Wealth Management Programs Advisory Council, and I'll be your moderator today. In terms of housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded, and you can enjoy a replay on the Columbia Wealth Management website later on. With respect to our discussion today, artificial intelligence, or AI, is one of the mega topics dominating the debate about the future of wealth management here in the US and around the globe. Before I introduce our wonderful panelists who will really bring this topic to life, allow me a few short words on the Masters in Wealth Management program, and let me give you a feel for the arc of today's conversation. Columbia University's Masters in Wealth Management is a 16-month part-time online program that prepares experienced and aspiring wealth management professionals to meet the disruptive challenges of today's industry. It is the only master's in wealth management provided by an Ivy League institution, and it provides students with the educational requirements to attain the CFP designation. You can learn more by typing Columbia University and wealth management into a web browser of your choice, or you can join us for one of our upcoming online information sessions either on November 1st or December 7th. And should you want to join us in person on the beautiful campus of Columbia University in New York City, you can do so on November 15th. You can find more information about these events online. With respect to the arc of today's conversation, first we'll have a panel discussion getting into our guests' thoughts on AI and how it already has and will continue to impact the wealth management industry. Towards the end, we'll open it up for questions from our students and faculty. So everybody out there on the lines, as we go along, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your page, and we'll feed them to our panelists later on. And with that, it is my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our very special guests for today who will shed light on this important topic from various angles. Please join me in welcoming, first off, Yelena Melamed, co-founder and head of product at Catchlight, an innovative lead gen tool coming out of Fidelity Labs up in Boston. Welcome, Yelena. Nice to be here, thank you. And dialing in from Texas, we have Robert Kirk, founder and CEO of Intergen Data, which is at the forefront of predicting important life events for the wealth and insurance industries. Howdy, Robert. Good morning to everybody. Thank you. From Boulder, Colorado, we are also joined yeah. by Nathan Stevenson, founder and CEO of Forward Lane, a next best action engine in the wealth management space. Hey there, Nathan. Thanks for having me, Philip. Good to be here. Last, not least, we are also thrilled to have Matthias Kuhlmai with us. Matthias is a senior lecturer with the Wealth Management Program, and he teaches our Disruption in Wealth Management course. Welcome, Matthias. You are on mute, my friend. Well, artificial intelligence, you see, I'm failing on the second word. Honored to be here. Thank you, Philip. We're all very human. And with that, let's humanize you even further. Some icebreakers are in order, a speed round, just to get you all to know, to, to get to know you all a little better. Let's have the cadence always be the same. Robert, Yelena, Nathan, wrapped up by Matthias. Robert, first off, your favorite books these days. On mute as well. Yes, there you go again, a human. So first uh, three books, probably most that I read, um, you're going to see uh, the Bible, uh, Think and Grow Rich, and then The Singularity is Near. 
Excellent. Um, I'd say I'd pick one uh, for me. Um, big fan of history, historical fiction, Kite Runner by Khalid Husseini. Wonderful. For me, um, I'm constantly reading like uh, AI papers on uh, archive, which is actually started by Columbia University. But the number one book that I am reading right now is called The Coming Wave by Mustafa Suleiman, who is the co-founder of DeepMind. Highly recommend it. And uh, Inflection.ai, which is also co-founded by uh, Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn. Excellent. Matthias, what do you have to add? Yeah, wrapping it up right now, I'm fascinated by Journey to the East. That is a short novel written by Hermann Hesse already in 1932. And it's interesting because the book is said to have served as the inspiration for Robert Greenleaf's model on servant leadership. Interesting suggestions from all of you. Next one, real quick. If you could invite three guests over for dinner, dead or alive, who would it be, Robert? Uh, so all mine are dead. <laughs> I would say it this way. First would be uh, Jesus, then would be Nikolai Tesla, and then Ada Lovelace. A wonderful mix. Yelena? I'll go with two. Um, Anthony Bourdain and my grandmother. I'll invite myself as the third. That could be fun. Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> um mine are <laughs> quite a quite a mix uh my first one is mahatma gandhi uh my second is thomas jefferson and my third is mustafa Suleiman. <laughs> there we go matthias i stay with family my grandfather paul who died when my father was three my great-grandmother on my mother's side we're missing a lot of information on that side of the family and then a much older version of myself, as we can be experimental here. And I know that this dinner will seriously mess with the space-time continuum, according to Back to the Future. <laughs> there we go. There we go. But maybe that's a flexible, foldable thing. Let's push the boundaries there. Oh, yeah. Last speed round, icebreaker question. And Nathan, you shared some of it already. What are our, your favorite resources and places to learn about AI, to stay current on that front? What resources can you recommend? So I would start with uh, Peter Diamandis's Abundance Insider. Uh, secondly, I'd go to Weights and Biases, and especially the two-minute papers with Dr. Jonah. That's a good one. I like the two minute papers, Robert. Um, I'd say for me, because we're in such a rapidly moving space, with a lot of exciting things happening all the time. Um, I'm a big fan of podcasts, uh, also a fun way to spend your commute. Um, A16Z, so Andreas and Horowitz podcasts are incredible on AI and Web3. Um, TWI, ML and AI podcasts are also great. I have a number of favorites. I can share some additional ones if there's interest. Wonderful. Nathan, in addition to the papers you mentioned before, any other key resource? Yeah, there's, um, um, so I read the information, which is a kind of a, a Silicon Valley uh, based news agency. Um, it kind of gives you the inside scoop on what's happening in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, for AI resources, there's, uh, I subscribe to a number of different newsletters. And I found that the newsletters are very valuable. One that uh, comes to mind is Runway. Um, and so if you just kind of Google Runway newsletter, that's um, got the latest and greatest information. And lastly, Axios. Uh, Axios AI, uh, they do a good job of breaking down um, both AI and there's a FinTech newsletter too, which is also very good. A great collection already. Matthias, anything to add? Yeah, wrapping it up, um, there's an AI for that, a fun blog, sort of very entertaining. And then I've really found pleasure in McKinsey's work on all industries and, and the AI implication. Very good illustrations. And if you are learning through visuals, I find it a very good and reliable resource. Excellent. Thank you all for sharing those resources. Before we dive into the discussion rounds, I'd like to briefly stage the conversation 
by sharing some perspectives around the definition, the subfields, and the history of AI. Can you all see a PowerPoint building up? Wonderful. In terms of definitions, in the mid-50s, John McCarthy, one of the fathers of AI, described the term, defined the term as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. As you can see, that definition has broadened ever since currently folks like Wikipedia and the McKinsey crew that Matthias mentioned define artificial intelligence not only as the science and engineering of making the machines, but the intelligence of machines themselves, their ability to perform the cognitive functions, which historically were associated with human minds only. So that's how the definition of AI is broadening and becoming more dynamic. AI itself, despite the definition, is a pretty broad term. And I think it's important to be aware of the multiple subfields that AI includes, including machine learning, knowledge-based systems, computer vision systems, robotics, NLP, natural language processing, and automated planning and optimization approaches. Those are the key subfields that AI capabilities these days tend to fall into. Looking forward to the upcoming discussion when our practitioners here bring their solutions to life, perhaps get us oriented. What subfield, what fields of AI are you marshalling in your solutions? The last page I wanted to show for now is a brief AI timeline. As we alluded to, AI got going, if you will, in the 50s, made some progress in the 60s, including, for example, the first chatbot, Eliza, which is almost 60 years old, 1964. Interestingly, for those of you in the audience who are old enough to remember, there was a bit of an AI winter in the 70s and 80s where people tried but essentially failed. Big breakthroughs appeared at the end of the last millennium where Deep Blue won against Gary Kasparov, a, waterside, a watershed event in 1997 that was followed in the late teens by AlphaGo uh, winning against the champion in the even more complex game of Go. You can see how Siri in 11 made a mass impact on the footprint and then Alexa in 14. If you extend this timeline to today, Obviously, the progress around self-driving cars, applications in medicine, and the recent phenomenal growth of natural language processing, big data models around ChatGPT are extending that dynamic timeline. So with that context, against that backdrop, let's dive into three rounds of discussion. I'm going to pose a broad question, and then our hope is that Robert Yelena and Nathan each take three minutes to provide their perspectives wrapped up by macro strategic top-down observations by our lecturer, Matthias Kulmai. Audience, when our panelists today talk about their respective solutions and contributions to the field of AI, please do not misperceive those as sales pitches. They're just illustrations of the cutting edge work that those respective firms are doing in the field of AI. So Robert, Yelena, with that, what does your AI do? Can you bring to life your tools, approaches? What are the use cases? What top type of AI are you using? And what are the benefits for users and the end clients? Let's do a speed round, three minutes each, please. Three minutes, let's go. So at our core, we're focused on harnessing the power of AI and ML, and it's specifically to serve banks, financial services, insurance, and healthcare. We believe we're at the forefront of developing solutions that really delve deep into understanding life, what occurs, the events, and their consequential financial implications. For example, imagine being able to help your customer kind of navigate through the complexities of life, finances, and risk before any major event occurs, good or bad, well, our technology takes basically de-identified customer data. We'll take as an example, age, race, gender, education, 
And then what we do is we return all of the life events that that one client might experience from the age of 15 until death. We then take and give you the information about what's likely to happen when and how much it would specifically impact your finances. And this could be anything from basically buying a home, having a child, or even getting cancer. Now, in reference to what we use, we employ a Bayesian approach to AI machine learning, and we kind of sprinkle in other algos, so k-means, clustering, regression, random forest, and even stable marriage as an example. And we do this because Bayesian probability allows us to model uncertainty throughout the probability distributions. And our model adapts as we keep receiving updated new information, either from the public sources, the private sources, or the individuals themselves. And that increases the accuracy over time. What we feel, though, is the benefit for our clients, if we think about it, is empowering anyone who provides advice to be able to offer a proactive solution, hyper-tailored to the individual. So not group mentality, not this large swath of people who make X amount of dollars. No, it's about moving the industry from a react and prescribe mentality to a predict, or excuse me, a predict and prevent data-driven methodology. Ultimately, what this means is that we're hyper-tailoring the way you can provide a plan, protect, or ensure everyone. Excellent. Quick follow-up question. Can you bring a use case or two to life how a wealth management or insurance company uses your service to enhance their offering? Yeah. So a very quick example would be today, we have a customer that would send us a uh, a large file of 100,000, 200,000 clients, we would then um, parse that data through, predict the life events, add and append a whole bunch of additional data and insights. And then what we do is we say out of 100,000 people, here's who you should target. Here's how much insurance they need to purchase for the next five, 10 or 15 years. And we give them the empirical data as to what living costs are, life event costs. And then in in tandem or basically in correlation to their family. So it allows them to say, here's how much insurance you need. You're not selling it. You're educating them on what they need because of who they are, where they live and what they do. Got it. So helping to get to more customized, better advisory and solution offerings by better understanding the probabilities of those that are being served to experience certain life events. Is that a fair way to think about it? Yes. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Yelena, over to you and your work at Catchlight. So we're focused on helping advisors grow um, their business and uh, really starts with problem statement. Prospecting is hard. Uh, it lacks focus, efficiency, and the key thing that we all as consumers expect, which is personalization. So what we do is we help use data to answer questions like, which of my leads are best fit? the segments that I'm targeting, which are most similar to where I've been most successful in converting business in the past, which looks similar to people in the world that tend to partner with an advisor with a fee and buying financial advice. And what are the pathways to use that same data to personalize engagement to the needs of the lead coming from a position of advisor who is focused on a particular niche and a particular service they provide. So how do we do that? Um, we start with um, very little information on those um, discrete prospects uh, that advisors already have. We then mine government record data and publicly disclosed data, so nothing of scraping uh, nature, um, to really build profiles. And then we use AI in three ways. One is kind of collecting that data to predict and score advice appetite. It's a machine learn model. Um, in our case, it's a random forest model. Um, we then um, also layer in other predictions, such as um, a model around uh, characteristics like investable assets, which is an important qualitative uh, qualifier in terms of advisory business. Um, and then we also leverage NLP, so large language models, to help mine that data in creating personalized engagements um, that advisors can use when they're reaching out to an individual or a segment. 
Excellent. So at its core, it is helping advisors with the key task of prospecting and prospect converting by providing more and better intelligence on those prospects they're pursuing. Is that the way to think about it? You got it. Wonderful. Nathan, Forward Lane, what is it you do? Sure. So Forward Lane is uh, focused on making uh, insights, creating insights, and using insights easier uh, for wealth managers. So what does it mean? Uh, Forward Lane started with the notion that uh, personalized, tailored advice is only really used to only be available to the ultra net worth. So we built a platform to help democratize uh, those insights. And, uh, you know, we work with partners like uh, Intergen Data and Bento Engine um, and others to aggregate structured and unstructured data um, around the holistic picture uh, of an advisor's daily workflow. So that's uh, looking at the, uh, the portfolio, the financial plan, uh, at news, at research, uh, it's mining CRM data using uh, NLP, which we developed um, uh, in-house, and um, and then layering on longevity and life events, so that you're really um, uh, monitoring that data with our signal engine um, on a real-time basis. So uh, that as an advisor, you're not having to do that yourself. Uh, advisors spend uh, uh, at least 50% of their time every day. That's a, a huge amount of cycles just spent date and gathering and analyzing data. We want to give those cycles back through decision making. And so we built a series of tool sets around that so that it's easier to create the insights from the combination of this data. It's easier to deliver them into Salesforce and into the workflow. And it's easy to take action on them with next best actions, which are recommended based on the types of insights. So, um, so that's um, and then our new platform emerge is really taking that personalization to uh, another level, where we can effectively inject those insights um, into a large language model. We work with Anthropic, um, and what that enables us to do is actually. Um, create a client engagement plan and uh, specific communications and recommendations as to how to engage that specific client. So it's much more about optimizing daily workflow, increasing productivity, and giving you the bird's eye view of all that data um, and giving it to you effectively on demand. Got it. So you are helping advisors get to the next best action, the next best activity by mining various data pools for important signals that indicates a need or opportunity. Got it. Matthias, over to you as the lecturer in our program. When you listen to these three particular manifestations of AI as just some examples of the great cutting edge work that's going on in our industry right now, what are your thoughts on the state of AI in wealth management more broadly? Yeah, Philip, um, first, I or we feel really reassured that what we are teaching very much echoes what, what our panelists are sharing here. One thing is very clear, AI is here already, right? It's not only in our daily lives, it's very much part of wealth management. <clears throat> so think about it. Nearly two thirds of wealth management firms are using AI today to drive process optimization. One third, still a high number, right? is engaging AI in a high number of use cases, including human decision optimization and so on. And then we have firms that are using AI to power you know, significant parts of their entire client advice model, you know, lead planning outcomes, lead organic growth. Uh, in fact, building on Nathan points, one big example is Morgan Stanley and their next best action system that really um, uh, improves the advisor uh, function. You know, what's fascinating when we look back at our academic focus here, fascinating is that the recent hype around AI really increased with the emergence of ChatGPT. And we are now leading an industry debate that is way ahead of status quo. 
And we are not concerned about artificial intelligence per se, but super intelligence, meaning AI taking our jobs, undermining forms of society and so on. And look, frankly speaking, this is where we, where I am skeptical. It is not dissimilar to the debate we let as an industry when robo-advisors first emerged or think, you know, recently of digital assets. You know, the end of banks and money or sovereign currency was a flavor of discussion. And when we think about it, also speaking in terms of our course, I'm very much in favor of disruption and innovation, but we have to be clear about sort of the monsters we are fighting here. So for now, I think we need to understand two things, Philip. AI is still in a basic state, not necessarily by capability and speed of evolution, but really when measured of how it can and is being applied to wealth management. And the second part, there's very little crossover, so to speak, of AI having fully replaced the human advice component. I want to build on a few points and, um, and, and sorry when I extend the lecture here in the sense of the word, Robert made a good point. We know from research that the share of direct advice, you know, especially with younger clients, is decreasing, meaning pure human to human interactions. And on the other side, the engagement with bionic applications is increasing, meaning how we engage between machine and human. And that is a really big theme in wealth management and part of our lecture, how to be and stay relevant. So we think today AI has the potential to further drive this ongoing evolution from a wealth management product and services marketplace to solutions and experiences. And in conclusion, just one thing on the hype of all of us losing our jobs. FAs will not lose their jobs to AI, but I think they may lose clients to firms using AI. That's sort of the, the essence of the message. Very well put, Matthias. Just to underscore here, all three solutions we're learning about today work for and through a human advisor. There are many offerings out there which explicitly acknowledge the massively important role that human advisors will continue to play in wealth management, but are seeking to amplify, to scale that precious human component. And the next quick comment is, I fully agree with you, AI is here already in ways large, as we've heard from our three panelists, and small. When you think, for example, about the invite to this very panel discussion, you saw five little pictures there of the panelists. At least two of them were not natural pictures, but generated by AI. So it's here already. It's all around us. On that note, let me give a shout out to Khalil Smith. Thank you for your great question that you put into the Q&A box. Others feel free to type in your questions as we go along. We'll address them later in the flow. And with that, let's go to round number two. After hearing about the great manifestations that you all bring to the table, what are some key lessons learned today from your front as you think about the rollout of AI in our industry? What are some successes? What's going well? And where do you see the challenges around adoption or impact? Let's stick with the same order, Robert, Yelena, Nathan, and then Matthias, bring us home. Yeah, thank you for that question. First, it's being an entrepreneur. Let's just put it that way. Um, secondly, post that, it's it's the journey with AI has been enlightening. It's been challenging, invigorating, and the most frustrating that I've ever dealt with in my entire career. Let's start with the successes. First is personalization. We've enabled businesses to a high, to offer highly personalized solutions. We actually think they're hyper-driven, meaning they're data-driven solutions. We can identify who you need to speak to out of 100,000 people within a matter of seconds. Efficiency, taking the speed and accuracy to which we can predict life events and then append data to give you insights you've never known about a client before previously, that's moved from a process that took weeks to days to now two seconds for 100,000 insights that we can generate. Integration with systems, that's another success where we see our compatibility with different systems using Azure, using Snowflake, but then being able to integrate it with marketing tools, with even guys like Nathan and Forward Lane. And what we can do with that has just been a tremendous success. But let's think about the challenges. Data quality. 
garbage in, garbage out. Look, the accuracy of any prediction is only as good as the data that's fed into the system. Not only does it have to be um, high quality, it needs to be clean, but the other side to that is, do they even collect the data? We've worked with firms that don't have, you would think they know a lot about their customers and they really don't. <laughs> the second I would probably say is adoption resistance. It's like any disruptive technology. There's always some resistance. Traditionalists in wealth management, they tend to be skeptical and they require us to invest in education and demonstrating our AI's capabilities. And I'm just going to say this openly, but not meant towards any particular firm. We had one firm that asked me, well, you say you're at a 94% accuracy rate on your Bayesian methodology. Why isn't it 95 or 96? And my first response in my head, I didn't say it, which was, well, let me ask you a question. In all your financial plans, are you 94% accurate? Well, the answer is no. So that's why they always do all these rebalancing and everything. So if you look at everything that was developed over the past 20 years for financial plans, they're all wrong. They're all wrong. Now, if you take that and then you add the last piece, which is really computational costs. When I look at it from this perspective, Bayesian approaches are powerful, but they can be intensive. So we have to balance the need for real-time predictions and what the customer believes is AI versus what they actually trying to do. You don't need to be real-time predictive to find out when somebody's pregnant. That doesn't mean anything. What means something is how much are they going to spend? Are they spending more than they make? Or are they spending less and can save and can invest? Those are probably all of those wrapped up together. Thank you. Excellent. I would hypothesize that many of the dynamics that you surfaced hold true and manifest themselves for our other panelists as well. So perhaps let's focus on where you deviate, where you can add to Robert's perspectives. So I will say I completely agree with a lot of the observations that Robert made. Um, I'll, I'll add the following. Um, we see ourselves as a data engine powering wherever the advisor ecosystem whatever it looks like. Um, and in that context, probably a challenging and an interesting solution that we've been very focused on over the last 18 months is developing strong feedback loops so that it is not a static experience. It is an ongoing, very live retraining, consuming data they're in and powering the data, powering those insights for advisors wherever they're doing their business development from. I'll also add a theme of where we play. There's a huge opportunity for advisors, right? Massive amount of generational wealth transfer. We estimate about 50% of all assets will change hands over the next 10 years. And thinking about from an opportunity perspective, um, we see advisors going into new markets where they haven't prospected before. And some of the things that we've had to solve for is how do you evaluate someone who is high earning, not rich yet, versus someone who is more mature in the developing of their um, asset pool and how do advisors really compare them apples to apples. And so we've built solutions for that, like an algorithm tying in um, what we know about the time horizon of a consumer um, and a number of assumptions like fees, but to really create a projected client revenue view so that you can do the apples to apples types of comparisons, not something that I immediately thought that we'd be solving, but a really interesting opportunity for us to focus on. I think lastly, I'd add insights are good. AI-powered insights are better, but that's not enough. Really what we've seen is connecting those insights into what will the advisor or the advisory firm or the home office or the marketer do next is the most powerful. And so how to use that data practically, like I'm going into a seminar that I'm hosting, how do I use scoring, use data insights to organize a seating chart? Seems basic, but how do I use data to even power something like that? 
if I'm an advisor or a single practitioner, I have very limited time. I have 15 minutes to prospect. What are the top three things and only three things that I'm going to do today, akin to what Noom does in the fitness realm, right? Get on scale every day, drink this many glasses of water every day. So identifying um, a social media link, a professional social media link of a prospect, serving that up to an advisor and saying, this is someone who is high scoring. We now have a link. You did not have that before. Go connect with Bob is an example of that. And lastly, is supporting advisor engagement with a range of tools, like identifying most fitting piece of marketing content they already have, leveraging personalized data about a consumer or a segment, all the way to generative content based on the unique profile of a consumer and the advisor that's doing the engagement. I think that's a great segue to you, Nathan. <laughs> yes, it sounds like we should work together, Yelena. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, as Yelena said, uh, you know, we spent, uh, we've been around for quite some time, about seven years now. And, you know, we've, we realized about two, three years in that, uh, that it's not only about activating the data, um, it's about what you do with that. And, you know, a simple uh, example illustration of that is, you know, if there's a weather report, um, that's great, but you still got to kind of go out and try and figure out what you're going to wear today. Is it going to be hot or cold? Um, and do that thinking for you. Um, and insights would be a notification that says it's going to be X degrees in your area and um, and uh, sunny. Uh, next best action would be bring an umbrella because it's going to be raining at 4 p.m., right? And I think that's what everybody wants to know fundamentally. Um, and uh, so we focused a lot on that, that piece. Um I, I would say that everything to get to those insights uh, requires a huge amount of work uh, from, and a large part of it's in fact about 80 to 90% of it is software engineering. Uh, it's the nitty gritty of building pipelines. And we have uh, 22 different NLP pipelines. Um, that look for a whole range of uh, different things, like even ECB uh, rates increases and how does that impact things. Um, so there's a, a lot of different uh, analytics um, involved. But what we found uh, following the next best actions is that everybody has their own idea of what a good insight is. And, um, and so we've now created the Figma of insights. Um, we've been working on for the almost past two years, and uh, we wanted to put, we wanted to simplify the insight creation process so that you could take data from, uh, from intergen data, from catch lights, um, and and combine it in unique and interesting ways, and uh, put it put it to play. Um, and our view as to how the the best way of of doing that is through a conversation interface, and. Um, you know, by imbuing that conversation interface with personas, um, you know, who's the client, uh, having a very rich near to near real time profile, um, so that you can then recommend good interactions. That's that's what we've been focused a lot on uh, recently. Excellent, uh, Matthias. Before we get to you to wrap up this round, I cannot help but observe how all of you alluded to the all important so what the all-important next step. Getting, transforming data into information and synthesizing information into insight is only part of the value chain. That insight needs to lead to recommendations and those recommendations need to need to action to complete the data value chain, if you will. And I think it's quite heartening that all of you who are at the forefront at the signal data piece very explicitly think through the so what, what happens downstream from your great work. That's for the benefit of everyone. Matthias, for you to bring us home, the theme of intergenerational wealth transfer of the next generation of investors has, you know, popped up in here. What are your thoughts on the changes in consumer dynamics, 
the needs and opportunities that the next wave of investors will provide. Yes, Philip, and thank you to the panelists here. Um, I was scratching my head what is left to offer here, you know, um, in terms of the discussion. But I think the AI discussion is often led in absence of actually the clients we want to attract and serve. It's a very important aspect because next to AI is the human element. So let me offer three things here to further the conversation. There's the aspect of client satisfaction first. There's also the aspect of client retention, especially when we sort of look at that younger generation of clients that want to engage with us. And then let's also talk about talent as an industry and how we think about our talent. So client satisfaction, from what we know, is very closely linked to a firm's digital capabilities. And it's estimated that about 80% of clients who view their wealth firm as a digital leader are satisfied with their firm. And I think there's some relevance when you look at a younger generation. It is instant gratification. I can go and uh, switch on Apple TV, Netflix. Everything is available to me. It is transparent. It's networked. It's benchmarked. And that's sort of the expectation. And we as a wealth management industry, we are not relevant in this context today as we need to be. Let's talk about retention. These younger clients, especially under the age of 40, as we uh, search has shown, when asked how likely they would be moving their assets if they were not happy with the digital tools provided, believe it or not, more than 50% of them would be actually considering a change. So here we're talking about the next best action to bring money in, but there's also the next best action of how do we actually keep it and stay relevant to this group. And I think there is a significant risk of closing this gap between you know, being relevant and not relevant. Let me go back to talent. You know, I said in the beginning, we can lead a debate if AI will take our jobs, but the other must have related debate is how do we need to change and support talent in our industry to live with AI? So what is, if I have this grandiose output, where do I bring it? And this in short, is where the human element comes in. Robert said it, we have an ability to curate, we have an ability to hyper-personalize our products and services while allowing AI to power and support our activities and engagement platforms. And to a large degree, we also need to recognize we are still a cookie cutter industry. And that will be the core issue that a lot of the things we do are meant to be at scale and that will be a challenge, but a challenge that AI is very worthy to sort of support in a change. Personalization and purpose are the keywords that I want to leave here. Excellent. Thank you for that, Matthias. Before we get to the questions and keep on submitting your great questions, please, let's do a speed round number three on future implications. This one, we're going to focus on Robert, Yelena, and Nathan. My ask to you is, where do you see AI going in wealth management? What opportunities and risks do you see? And building on Matthias's great comments, what implications do you see for human advisors, keeping in mind that many on the line today are aspiring or mid-career advisors that firmly believe in the future of our field? Robert? Yeah, so first let's let let's start with wealth management and any advice provider is undeniably intertwined with AI. That's not going to change. I, fee I foresee a world where AI is not only taking the data from Yelena and her company in Catchlight, working through Intergen, pulling other data sources, where all of this, is, it's a significant portion of financial planning. I would also venture to say also insurance. This is especially important because we have 75 million boomers that are about to be over 65 by 2030. The older generations are going to need insurance and they're going to need health care, but they're also going to need help in divesting those assets to the next generations. And when they inherit that, what better way to actually forecast what's likely to happen to them? I have a struggling artist who's a daughter in New York. Guess what? She might need a different way to inherit than the person who's a doctor, a cardiac surgeon in Maryland. Um, but therein lies the opportunities and risks, right? So they're vast from an opportunistic standpoint. 
hyper tailoring is going to be the way we go. Individualized insurance, individualized um, health, individualized wealth. That's where we're heading. Real-time risk assessments is going to also power that. And I kind of take a quote from Stan Lee and Spider-Man and say, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's, I don't think it's a risk in data privacy. I think we'll get there to that point. Plus you just don't realize how much of your own data is out there. I think it's a risk in over-reliance of AI without human oversight, without the context of saying, this doesn't make sense. I don't, you shouldn't be selling this annuity to this 20 year old. You will go to jail. And then I think that the other part to that is going to be really determining in the predictions, are they ethical? Are they unbiased? How do you prove that you're unbiased? We see it one way. We see it as show every race, show every gender, show everything and, and look at it from that perspective, celebrate differences and use that data because ultimately the implications are that for the humans, AI's going to play a pivotal role. We can't deny it. We're not going to be able to stop it. But human touch is just irreplaceable. And to date, there is no computer that is empathetic to any individual. I mean, it's binary. It's zeros and ones. Can you somewhat intimate? Not really. It's really, really hard to do that. And so I think at that point, the emotional intelligence, the empathy, that's where the human takes over. Maybe they're more of a concierge, but man, they're worth their, their weight in gold. Excellent. Yana? Um, first of all, I'll, I'll make some observations that, Robert, I think you're spot on. Um, I think um, huge opportunity. And I think we already said, see, AI knows that I'm not in the room. I haven't been breathing. Uh, but um, I will make the observation that um, it's commonplace. Uh, we see a lot of stories in the industry uh, that you know, certain types of AI is being barred from one institution versus the other. And um, what's interesting is the applications they're already using, even their mail client is already introducing AI componentry, um, including ones that they're directly banning. So it's um, it's not a world to fight, it's a world to embrace. Um, I think um, what's great there is, it's a great component um, of your toolkit a human toolkit to be able to provide or see what the naked eye just can't see. Um, the insights across big data um, that will make you more efficient, that will make you more personalized in your outreach, um, and that matters. And I think it allows an advisor or advisory firm to stand out when they're competing, both for new business, but um, to Matthias's earlier point, to retain their existing business because the consumers that we're also struggling to kind of keep inside of the wealth management umbrella and, and coddle in terms of relationships and provide them that version of advice that we think is critical to their success is also the consumer that may later download an app, call it ABC, to be able to double check have a second opinion of whether or not their advisor is doing their job, at least according to that particular app. So the way we tend to see it is an AI is a critical component to compete and embrace the opportunity that the data provides and the insights provide. It's also a good defensive mechanism. Let's say you're not looking to grow and some of the capabilities I described in Catchlight um, are not critical for you. Being able to retain, retain is maybe not critical to you because you're maturing that business to another advisor or to an M&A activity, um, some sort of a succession event. But being um, responsible for your clients and defending them against things like financial crime, AI will become a critical component there as well. But I will also echo what Robert and I think Philip, you said in the past, it's advice is based on trust. It is a relationship business. No piece of machinery will independently earn it. And even if I will download an app and get a second opinion, I will not bet on an app without a human in the middle so that I know who to pick up the phone and call and ask questions about when the market is not doing so well, or something is happening in my family or some version of that. Um, I think that's how we see it. And I think the last risk piece that I'll touch on is Getting an AI or buying an AI and using it as a component of your toolkit 
Um, it, AI needs to come from trusted brands. What does that mean? It means brands that will invest into back testing, retraining, um, feedback loops, bias testing, third party evaluations of both the data and the AI that's built on top of that data. That's critical so that you know that the outcomes and outputs, even though they are human advised at the end, are based on something you can stand behind. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Nathan, anything to build on? Anything to add? Yeah, um, I could actually talk on the subject uh, for days, but uh, I'll pick three specific things. Uh, the first is uh, I got to uh, to join a talk last week, um, which uh, had the CEO of GitHub, Thomas uh, Domke, uh, talking about co-pilots uh, for developers. And I think that uh, analogy to how software developers are, are now uh, going to be automating 80 to 90% of their code um, is really particularly relevant for wealth management. He described it as um, it, it kind of this thin slice at the very top is what, uh, what developers will do. And this abstraction process uh, in terms of capabilities, it has been ongoing for years and years and years with technology. Uh, it just means that these developers, the new developers that use Copilots and the next generation of Copilots will be able to cover much, much larger code bases um, with way little efforts. Um, and so I think that that to me is a really great analogy for how AI can be used as in wealth management. I see and things Nathan, more. If as... I jump in there just for a second, it Go reminds ahead. me of the good age all trend of new technologies helping human advisors to upskill and focus on ever more value added activities by doing the basic blocking and tackling for us. I think that momentum, that dynamic we're observing now with AI as well. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, abs uh, abs absolutely. Um, I agree with that. Um, to uh, the second uh, aspect is that uh, the next generation, like call it the 2024 edition, um, is going to be uh, focused. I mean, we've all heard about multimodal, which is ability to interpret charts and mathematics and images alongside text. We know about that. But what's more interesting than that is interactivity. Um, so right now we think of interactive as ask a question and get an answer, ask a question, get an answer. But this is much more about, about planning and interaction. So when you ask a question, uh, you know, ask for how, and you can actually do this today, ask ChatGPT or, or Claude uh, for the steps involved. And right now those steps are kind of uh, estimated let's say, based off of other logic. But in the near future, they're going to be very, very well thought through and very well planned out. And you'll have the ability to modify those steps and check the logic along the way uh, or ask for explanations of that logic. And so what that means is a new ability to plan. Um, and I think that this could be extremely powerful for financial planning, uh, for wealth managers, um, certainly for incorporating all these new analytics uh, from the likes of Calculite and Intergen. So I think this interactivity, the planning, very, uh, very key. And then the last thing, uh, the third point is that, um, you yeah, know, let's not forget about democratization here. Uh, you know, one of the biggest barriers to adoption of wealth management is that financial advisor. I mean, I don't know who feels like spending $5,000 tomorrow just to get a financial plan. I don't, right? I don't actually have a financial advisor uh, for that specific reason. I don't think it's worth spending that amount of money. And uh, But think of most of America. Think of the rest of the world. Um, if you've got a phone these days and access to ChatGPT for free, you can get a huge amount of financial education at very low cost. And um, and I think that making these types of tools available um, 
And these types of insights, more democratized, I think is, um, you know, we always want to help people in wealth management, protect them from risks, help them have a better life for the future for their children. Um, I think that this could really, really expand the reach of wealth management and give it renewed purpose and renewed meaning. Three um, great points, Nathan. Let me jump in there, keeping an eye on the clock. Appreciate all those perspectives. I do want to tackle briefly a few of the wonderful questions that came in. First off, Khalil, I hope you concur. Matthias in particular put it well. You, as a 25-year-old CFP entering our industry, should not be concerned about your future as long as you embrace technology and all the wonderful work it can do for and with you. It should remain a bright one. I'm going to articulate a question from Tom around compliance and governance consideration that I thought was a very interesting one, and hopefully one of you dares to provide a view. Tom, I'm paraphrasing, but you're pointing out that compliance and appropriate governance of emerging AI capabilities is key to keeping everybody safe and facilitating a healthy growth and adoption of all the positives it can bring to the table. Yes, regulators might be late, might be learning themselves. Let's acknowledge that. My question is to the audience, have you seen good governance approaches that you want to you know, make sure others are aware of? What are your thoughts and recommendations around the ethics, the governance, the compliance around AI? Any takers? I'll jump in real quickly. So we, in our predictions of our life events, so one of the things that we did is we actually went directly to the SEC. My corporate world, I dealt with regulators for many years, had to supply them with sets of data. The good thing is that the government, even though it takes a long time to get anything done, will actually try to list out what is or is not within their compliance and regulation. It is listed out. And the the PII laws, the, the best interest laws, they're really trying to focus on protecting the little guy. So the more data you can provide around the little guy and why or why something is not pertinent to them is really helpful. So when we actually used, when we spoke to the SEC, we actually used their regulation and their clauses and their words to say, you said this, if we did this, does that support it in your mind or does it not support it? The, the real governance is going to be made up from everyone and we're going to have to follow that but you have to participate, which means you have to have a compliance first mentality. Well, technically client first, compliance second, then take that data, take what you're doing to the regulators, ask them, they're willing to sit and talk. They want you to do this because they know they're not at the forefront. And they also understand that they can't implement a, a large swath of regulation without hearing from people. And that's what they want to do. Excellent. Before we wrap, one more question coming from the audience that I want to make sure we address, and that's around training. Advisor, employee, middle, back office training on these emerging technologies, again, key to success to making this work for everybody in the short, mid, and long term. Do you have any perspectives, best practices, thoughts on training? I think with regard to the product experience, which is how I'm interpreting the question, um, it's critical. It has to be simple. It has to work in the ecosystem where advisors already do the work. And if it is playing independently, it needs to be super simple. There's no, um, it, it's, it's incredible how many conversations I've had with advisors throughout my career about, well, this is very difficult to integrate, or this is very difficult to do, or a whole collection of that. And it starts with advisors have a little time. As service providers, we need to embrace that and figure out how to create products, AI or otherwise, that will tackle that head on. And so using a tool should be as basic as, I think about it as helping a, someone find a dining experience. You know, how do you make prospecting as simple as finding, you know, what type of a dining experience you like, which uh, are your best bets, and how to think about what to order from the menu? I mean, that's, that's a terrible analogy in some cases, but Robert? No, I, I was going to say you're spot on 100%. 
speak to them like uh, you're they're your five year old child. You mm-hmm. you don't talk to them about homomorphic algorithms and talk to them about you know you don't need to go there. You need how are we going to help? They just want like you said they have little time. How can you help them? I would uh, just uh, last last points. I think that this is a uh, an excellent new uh, course that Matthias and Philip will be putting together as part of the next Columbia program <laughs> on how to use AI in the workplace. I also think it's a great opportunity for those of you who are entrepreneurial. Uh, there is a massive opportunity to provide uh, workflow-based training for wealth managers uh, in the workplace. So, yeah. That's Excellent. As we wrap it up, we're at the appointed hour. Matthias, any final thoughts from you and given the disruption in wealth management course focus? I give you four points, Philip. AI is here already. Bionic business models will lead the way. We need to prepare for values-based advice. People will ask us what we stand for. And hyper-personalization, the segments of one are the key to keep in mind. Very well synthesized. We could go on for a lot longer, but it's time to wrap. We hope that you enjoyed today's discussion and took away as much food for thought from it as I did to all of our panelists It's been a true pleasure. Thank you on behalf of Columbia University for your time, wisdom, and perspectives. Consider yourself a friend of Columbia's going forward. Next time in your, you're in New York City, swing by our beautiful campus. With that, everybody have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.